preface to the nineteen ninety eight edition of migration of birds circular number sixteen revised nineteen ninety eight by the u s fish and wildlife service this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sue anderson frederick c lincoln's migration of birds was published in nineteen thirty five lincoln's writing style effectively communicated the wonders of bird migration to a wide audience both young and old experienced observers of birds as well as the simply curious indeed the demand for this little book was so great that it was revised in 1950 and soon was out of print again. In 1979, Stephen R. Peterson developed a second revision, adding additional examples and presenting an understanding of bird migration that reflected current research. The style, figures, and most of the content of the original publication were retained, but new illustrations were added where appropriate in this present revision large sections of the text have remained unchanged from the previous revision or only slightly modified to make the discussion compatible with current understanding the geographic emphasis of lincoln and the wealth of pertinent examples added by peterson have been maintained i have made substantial changes however in sections dealing with the evolution of migration stimulus for migration orientation and navigation and the influence of weather i have also changed the emphasis of the final section to reflect current concerns while some investigators are mentioned by name specific studies are not cited in the text an extensive bibliography has been included for those interested in pursuing the subject further i have relied heavily upon the bibliographies on migration research prepared by stanley h anderson and lauren w ayers university of wyoming fish and wildlife co-op unit and thomas s litwin as well as the bibliography in peterson's revision additional citations have been suggested by daniel r petit and stephanie l jones u s fish and wildlife service this edition was due to the support of the fish and wildlife service regional non-game migratory bird coordinators tara zimmerman kent wool steve lewis daniel petit diane pence stephanie jones bill howe and richard coon i am indebted to all these investigators and most grateful for their assistance John Zimmerman, 1998. End of 1998 preface. Introduction to the 1998 edition of Migration of Birds by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The changing picture of bird populations throughout the year intrigues those who are observant and who wish to know the source and destination of these birds. While many species of fish, mammals, and even insects undertake amazing migratory journeys, birds as a group are the most mobile creatures on earth. Even humans, with their many vehicles of locomotion, do not equal some birds in mobility no human population moves each year as far as from the arctic to the antarctic with subsequent return yet arctic turns do birds are adapted in their body structure and physiology to life in the air their feathered wings and tails bones lungs and air sacs and their metabolic abilities all contribute to this amazing faculty 
these adaptations make it possible for birds to seek out environments most favorable to their needs at different times of the year this results in the marvelous phenomenon we know as migration the regular recurrent seasonal movement of populations from one geographic location to another and back again throughout human experience migratory birds have been important as a source of food after a lean winter and as the harbinger of change in seasons the arrival of certain species has been heralded with appropriate ceremonies in many lands among the eskimos and other tribes this phenomenon is the accepted sign of the imminence of spring of warmer weather and a reprieve from winter food shortages the european fur traders in alaska and canada offered rewards to the native american who saw the first flight of geese in the spring and all joined in jubilant welcome to the newcomers as north america became more thickly settled the large flocks of ducks and geese as well as migratory rails doves and woodcock that had been hunted for food became objects of the enthusiastic attention of an increasing army of sportsmen most of the non-game species were also found to be valuable as allies of the farmer in his never-ending confrontation against insect pests and weed seeds and in more recent years all species have been of ever increasing recreational and aesthetic value for untold numbers of people who enjoy watching birds we soon realized that our migratory bird resource was an international legacy that could not be managed alone by one state or country and that all nations were responsible for its well-being the need for laws protecting game and non-game birds as well as the necessity to regulate the hunting of diminishing game species followed as a natural consequence in the management of this wildlife resource it has become obvious that studies must be made of the species habits environmental needs and travels in the united states the department of the interior recognized the value of this resource and is devoted to programs that will ensure sustainability for these populations as they are faced with the impacts of alteration in land use loss of habitat and contaminants from our technological society hence bird investigations are made by the u s fish and wildlife service the arm of the department of interior charged by congress under the migratory bird treaty act with the duty of protecting these avian species that in their yearly journeys pass back and forth between the united states and other countries in addition the federal government through the activities of the biological resources division of the u s geological survey also promotes basic research on migration federal agencies cooperate with their counterparts in other countries as well as with state agencies academic institutions and non-governmental groups to gain understanding and for the protection of migratory species through such endeavors as partners in flight a broadly based international cooperative effort in the western hemisphere for almost a century the fish and wildlife service and its predecessor the biological survey have been collecting data on the important details of bird migration scientists have gathered information concerning the distribution and seasonal movements of many species throughout the western hemisphere from the arctic archipelago south to tierra del fuego supplementing these investigations is the work of hundreds of u s latin american and canadian university personnel and volunteer bird watchers who report on the migrations and status of birds observed in their respective localities these data 
stored in field notes computer files and scientific journals constitute an enormous reservoir of information pertaining to the distribution and movements of north american birds the purpose of this publication is to summarize these data and additional information from other parts of the world to present the more important facts about our current understanding of the fascinating subject of bird migration the u s fish and wildlife service is grateful to the many people who have contributed their knowledge so that others whether in biology and ornithology classes members of conservation organizations or just individuals interested in the welfare of the birds may understand and enjoy this precious resource as well as preserve it for generations to come end of introduction chapter one of the migration of birds by the u s fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain early ideas about migration the migrations of birds probably attracted the attention and aroused the imagination of humans since our african genesis recorded observations on the subject date back nearly three thousand years to the times of hesiod homer herodotus and aristotle in the bible there are several references to the periodic movements of birds as in the book of job chapter thirty nine verse twenty six where the inquiry is made doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom and stretch her wings toward the south the author of jeremiah chapter eight verse seven wrote the stork in the heavens knoweth her appointed time and the turtle dove and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming the flight of migratory quail that saved the israelites from starvation in their wanderings through the sinai wilderness is now recognized as a vast migration between their breeding grounds in eastern europe and western asia and their winter home in africa aristotle naturalist and philosopher of ancient greece was one of the first observers whose writings are known to discuss the subject of bird migration he noted cranes traveled from the steppes of scythia to the marshes at the headwaters of the nile and pelicans geese swans rails doves and many other birds likewise passed to warmer regions to spend the winter pliny the elder a roman naturalist in his historia naturalis repeated much of what aristotle had written on migration and added comments of his own concerning the movements of european species of starlings thrushes and blackbirds aristotle also must be credited with the origin of some superstitious beliefs that persisted for several centuries one of these that birds hibernated became so firmly rooted that the eminent nineteenth century american ornithologist dr elliot coos listed in eighteen seventy eight the titles of no less than one hundred and eighty two papers dealing with the hibernation of swallows the students of aristotle believed the disappearance of many species of birds in the fall was accounted for by their passing into a torpid state where they remained during the cold season hidden in hollow trees eaves or in the mud of marshes aristotle ascribed hibernation not only to swallows but also to storks kites and doves some early naturalists wrote fantastic accounts of flocks of swallows allegedly seen congregating in marshes until their accumulated weight bent the reeds into the water submerging the birds which apparently then settled down for a long winter's nap it was even recorded that when fishermen in northern waters drew up their nets they sometimes had a mixed catch 
of fish and hibernating swallows olus magnus archbishop of upsala published a work in 1555 entitled historia de gentibus septentrionalis et natura observing that if swallows so caught were taken into a warm room they would soon begin to fly about but would only live a short time the idea of hibernation as a regular method of spending the winter is no longer broadly accepted for birds although the common poor will is a possible exception many species however such as chickadees swallows hummingbirds swifts and night jars regularly go into torpor under cold stress on winter nights but also even during the breeding season aristotle also was the originator of the theory of transmutation the seasonal change of one species into another frequently one species would arrive from the north just as another species departed for more southerly latitudes from this he reasoned the two different species were actually one and assumed different plumages to correspond to the summer and winter seasons probably the most remarkable theory advanced to account for migration is contained in a pamphlet titled an essay toward the probable solution of this question whence come the stork and the turtle dove the crane and the swallow when they know and observe the appointed time of their coming published in 1703 it is written by a person of learning and piety whose probable solution stated migratory birds flew to the moon and there spent the winter some people who could easily accept the migratory travels of larger birds were unable to understand how smaller species some of them notoriously poor flyers could make similar journeys they accordingly conceived the idea that larger species for instance storks and cranes carried their smaller companions as living freight in some southern european countries it is still believed that these broad pinioned birds serve as aerial transports for hosts of smaller birds that congregate upon the mediterranean shore awaiting the opportunity for passage to winter homes in africa similar beliefs such as hummingbirds riding on the backs of geese have been found among some tribes of native americans in the western hemisphere such fantasies however are not without some empirical basis such as the observation of an eastern kingbird harassing a great horned owl that actually perched on the shoulder of the owl's outstretched wing as the owl glided toward wooded cover today we realize that birds do not migrate by hitching rides with other birds and that the scope of the migration phenomenon is world-wide not simply limited to the northern hemisphere or the world's land masses the migration heritage is developed just as extensively in old world warblers migrating to and from europe and africa as in our wood warblers traveling from canada and the united states to south america and back although south temperate zone species migrate northward to the tropics during the austral winter no land species nesting in the south temperate zone migrates into the north temperate zone some seabirds like the sooty shearwater and wilson's storm petrel however migrate to north temperate seas after nesting on shores south of the equator end of chapter one Chapter 3 of the Migration of Birds by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Techniques for Studying Migration 
since this publication first appeared in 1935 traditional methods as well as new procedures have been used in the study of bird migration on occasion a method developed for a quite different but related purpose has become an invaluable innovative technique in our continuing exploration of the migration phenomenon direct observation the oldest simplest and most frequently used method of studying migration is by direct observation size color song and flight of different species all aid the amateur as well as the professional in determining when birds are migrating studies by wells w cook and his collaborators from 1888 to 1915 and continued by his successors in the u.s bureau of biological survey later u.s fish and wildlife service were of particular importance in the earlier years of these investigations in north america some of the largest and most interesting routes and patterns were sorted out by tediously compiling and comparing literally thousands of observations of species in a given locality at a particular time of the year more recently the national audubon society and many state audubon and ornithological societies publish information in their bulletins and newsletters on direct observation of migration in the aggregate direct observation has contributed much to our knowledge of migration but this method is limited by its being largely restricted to daytime ground-based data on birds either before or after a period of actual migratory flight the moon watch is a modification of the direct observation method many species of birds migrate at night until mid-century it was not apparent just how prevalent nocturnal migration really was significant information has been derived from watching the passage of migrating birds across the face of a full moon through telescopes noting both the numbers and directions of flight since the actual percent of the sky observed by looking through a telescope at the moon is extremely small approximately one hundred thousandth of the observable sky the volume of birds recorded is small on a night of heavy migration about thirty birds per hour can be seen the fact that any birds are observed at all is testimony to the tremendous numbers passing overhead a large-scale cooperative moon watching study was organized and interpreted by george h lowry jr of louisiana state university in the nineteen sixties oral another nocturnal observation method which has potential for species identification during the study of migration is the use of a parabolic reflector with attached microphone to amplify call chip notes this device when equipped with a tape recorder can record night migrants up to eleven thousand feet on nights with or without a full moon a primary disadvantage is that one cannot tell the direction a bird is traveling furthermore there may be some difficulty in identifying the chip notes made by night migrants since these calls are often different from the notes heard during the daytime unfortunately the bird may not call when it is directly over the reflector and consequently it would not be recorded preserved specimens reference material consisting of preserved bird skins with data on time and place of collection exists in many natural history museums the essential ingredient in studying migration by this method is to have an adequate series of specimens 
taken during the breeding season so differences in appearance between geographically separated breeding populations of the same species can be discerned such properly identified breeding specimens may be used for comparison with individuals collected during migration to associate them with their breeding areas this provides a convenient way of recognizing and referring to individuals representative of known populations wherever they may be encountered marking if birds can be captured marked and released unharmed a great deal of information can be learned about their movements many different marking methods have been developed to identify particular individuals when they are observed or recaptured at a later date since 1920 the marking of birds with numbered leg bands in north america has been under the direction of the u s fish and wildlife service and more recently the biological resources division of the u s geological survey in cooperation with the canadian wildlife service every year professional biologists and volunteers working under permit place bands on thousands of birds both game and non-game large and small migratory and non-migratory each band carries a serial number on the outside and an address where recovered bands can be sent on the inside when a banded bird is reported from a second locality a definite fact relative to its movements becomes known the study of many such cases leads to a more complete knowledge of the details of migration the records of banded birds have also yielded other important information relative to migrations such as arrival and departure dates the length of time different birds pause on their migratory journeys to feed and rest the relation between weather conditions and starting times for migration the rates of travel for individual birds and the degree of regularity with which individual birds return to the summer or winter quarters used in former years many banding stations are operated systematically throughout the year and supply much information concerning the movements of migratory birds that heretofore could only be surmised the most informative banding studies are those that focus on particular populations of birds examples of such planned banding programs are the extensive marking of specific populations of ducks and geese on their breeding grounds by the u s fish and wildlife service and the canadian wildlife service as well as operation recovery the cooperative program of banding small land birds along the atlantic coast when these banded birds are recovered information concerning movements and survival rates of specific populations or the vulnerability to hunting is gained colored leg bands neck collars or streamers can be used to identify populations or specific individuals and birds marked with easily observed tags can be studied without having to kill or recapture individuals thus making it a particularly useful technique we have learned about the migratory habits of some species through banding but the method does have shortcomings to study the migration of a particular species through banding the banded bird must be encountered again at some later date if the species is hunted such as ducks or geese the number of returns per one hundred birds banded is considerably greater than if one must rely on a bird being retrapped or found dead for example in mallards banded throughout north america the average number of bands returned the first year 
is about twelve per cent in most species that are not hunted less than one per cent of the bands are ever seen again in nineteen thirty five lincoln commented that with enough banding some of the winter ranges and migration routes of more poorly understood species could become better known a case in point is the chimney swift a common bird in the eastern united states this species winters in south america over five hundred thousand chimney swifts have been banded but only twenty one have been recovered outside the united states thirteen from peru one from haiti and the rest from mexico the conclusion is simply this whereas banding is very useful for securing certain information the volume of birds that need to be banded to obtain a meaningful number of recoveries for determining migratory pathways or breeding or wintering areas may be prohibitive one problem in interpretation of many banding results is the fact that recoveries may often reflect the distribution of people rather than the distribution of birds radio tracking radio tracking or telemetry is accomplished by attaching a small radio transmitter that gives off periodic signals or beeps from a migrating bird with a radio receiving set mounted on a vehicle or airplane it is possible to follow these radio signals and trace the progress of the migrating bird one of the most dramatic examples of this technique was reported by richard graber in nineteen sixty five he captured a gray-cheeked thrush on the university of illinois campus and attached a 2.5 gram transmitter a penny weighs three grams the bird was followed successfully for over eight hours on a course straight north from urbana across chicago and up lake michigan on a continuous flight of nearly 400 miles at an average speed of 50 miles per hour there was a 27 mile per hour tailwind aiding the bird it is interesting to note that while the little thrush flew up the middle of lake michigan the pursuing aircraft skirted the edge of the lake and terminated tracking on the northern end after running low on fuel while the bird continued to fly on the limitations of radio telemetry of course are the size of the transmitter that can be placed on birds without interfering with flight and the ability of the receiving vehicle to keep close enough to the flying bird to detect the signals despite this difficulty there has been considerable development in the technology and encouraging results to date give promise for the future particularly when birds can be tracked by orbiting satellites yet this technique should be used cautiously since several studies have demonstrated that transmitter equipped birds have significantly lower survival radar observation radar was developed to identify and track aircraft electronically and was an innovation that was critical to england's success in the battle of britain during the early years of the second world war early radar observers noted however that they were receiving moving returns that could not be associated with aircraft these radar echoes whimsically termed angels by observers in england were soon discovered to be birds that bird flight could be monitored by radar was seized upon by students of migration after the end of the war as an opportunity to obtain information on the movements of birds during both day and night and over extensive geographic areas three types of radar have been used for studying birds one general surveillance radar similar to ones located at airports 
that scans a large area and indicates the general time and direction of broad movements of birds second tracking radar that records the path of an airplane or bird across the sky by locking on to a designated target and continuously following only that object and third doppler radar similar to those operated by law enforcement agencies for measuring the speed of a passing automobile or by meteorologists for detecting tornadic winds the data collected by radar can be electronically stored in the absence of a human observer and can be correlated with weather data sets the use of radar in migration studies has been invaluable in determining direction and speed of mass bird movements dates and times of departure height of travel and general volume especially at night one interesting fact to come out of current radar work is the discovery of relatively large movements of warblers and other small land birds migrating over oceans rather than along coastlines and in directions about which ground-based observers were completely unaware end of chapter three chapter four of the migration of birds by the u s fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain evolution of migration the rigors of the annual migratory journey are balanced by benefits derived from species being able to inhabit two different areas during seasons when each region provides favorable conditions upland sandpipers breeding in the grasslands of north america and wintering on the pampas of argentina never experience winter if it were not advantageous to make the trip twice a year the behavior would not have evolved or if once typical under one set of conditions natural selection would have eliminated the tendency once the environment changed an example of the latter case is the european starling which is migratory on the continent but the population isolated in the british isles by the rise in sea level after the end of the pleistocene glaciation and now living in a moderate maritime climate has secondarily evolved non-migratory behavior by departing in the spring from their wintering ranges to breeding areas migrant species are probably assured of reduced interspecific competition for adequate space and resources such as ample food for themselves and their offspring permanent residents in temperate zones whose wintering and breeding areas are in the same region also gain a net benefit by being non-migratory although not suffering the metabolic demands and hazards of migration the energetic demands for survival and reproduction in an environment with greater annual range of climatic variation and the need to adapt to the seasonal changes in the availability and kinds of foods are comparable even for permanent residents in the tropics where climatic variation is relatively low these benefits are offset by lower reproductive success resulting from higher nest predation while the various kinds of wood warblers and flycatchers are wholly migratory other species like most woodpeckers are permanent residents some populations of species have individuals that are migratory while other individuals breeding in the same area are not these partial migrant species like blue jays exemplify the difficulty in suggesting simple singular explanations for the origin of migration birds require specific environmental resources for reproduction 
among both migratory and non-migratory species alike adequate food for the young appears to be primary in determining where as well as when a species will breed american goldfinches and pine siskins are closely related and winter together in gregarious flocks with the emergence of abundant insect food in the spring siskins disperse and begin nesting while goldfinches postpone their reproduction until late summer when thistle seeds become available for feeding young for other species like waterfowl the availability of suitable nest sites rather than food for the young appears to determine the time of breeding the evolution of migration also involves adaptations that affect the timing of this behavior so that the species is in the breeding or wintering habitat under the most propitious conditions for most migrants especially long distance migrants the evolution of migratory behavior demands a physiological response to environmental cues in preparation for migration that are different from the environmental factors that ultimately determine their reproductive success on the breeding range or survival on the wintering range thus in the fall swallows and other insectivorous species depart southward long before food resources or weather become critical for their survival factors other than a decrease in food availability or cold stress for example must prompt their migratory departure the verdant flush of regrowth in the spring is clearly associated with migratory movements of many species to higher latitudes where longer day lengths provide ample time for feeding young permitting their rapid growth and shorter exposure in the nest to predation but the higher the latitude the shorter the breeding season so that while summer days may be long the summer season is short and migrants in more northerly climes may have only one chance to breed before they must again travel southward at lower latitudes breeding seasons are longer allowing multiple attempts to produce young this longer breeding season however is related to a higher probability that nests will suffer losses to predators fall departure from higher latitudes removes individuals from climatic conditions that will eventually exceed their physiological tolerance limits the dick sissel is a neotropical migrant that breeds as far north as winnipeg but cannot survive environmental temperatures below freezing during the short days of winter at mid-temperate latitudes. The arrival of migrants on the winter range, however, increases the chances for greater interspecific competition with resident species in years when resource availability might be reduced. This cost plus the hazards associated with the migratory journey decreases adult survivorship the evolution of migratory behavior must on average offer a favorable balance between these various costs and benefits birds appear in the fossil record distinct from their reptilian ancestors about 150 million years ago for the next 50 million years or so, a relative uniform and benign maritime climate pervaded the earth. Sometime around 65 million years ago, however, global climate abruptly changed, perhaps from impact by a large asteroid, and the biota of the planet suffered a major episode of extinction. But a remnant lineage of birds survived and gave rise to the modern groups of birds we see today yet with the slow continuing drift of the continents into higher latitudes that began soon after the first appearance of birds and the development of mountain ranges as a result of the collision between tectonic plates 
climates became more latitudinally and often longitudinally differentiated the resulting diversity in habitats provided the selective pressures that led to the evolution of migration again and again in different species the general model for the evolution of migratory behavior considers a permanent resident that expands its range due to intraspecific competition into an area that is seasonally variable providing greater resources for reproduction but harsher climatic stress and reduced food availability in the non-breeding season individuals breeding in these new regions at the fringe of the species distribution are more productive but in order to increase non-breeding survival they return to the ancestral range this results however in even greater intraspecific competition because of their higher productivity so that survival is enhanced for individuals that winter in areas not inhabited by the resident population the common yellow throat of the atlantic coast is a good example birds occupying the most southern part of the species range in florida are largely non-migratory whereas populations that breed as far north as newfoundland migrate to the west indies in the winter well removed from the resident population in florida because a migrant population gains an advantage on both its breeding and wintering range it becomes more abundant while the resident non-migratory population becomes proportionately smaller and smaller in numbers if changing environmental conditions become increasingly disadvantageous for the resident population or interspecific competition becomes more severe the resident population could eventually disappear leaving the migrant population as characteristic of the species these stages in the evolution of migration are represented today by permanent resident populations partial migrants and fully migratory species as for all adaptations natural selection continues to mold and modify the migratory behavior of birds as environmental conditions perpetually change and species expand or retract their geographic ranges hence the migratory patterns that we observe today will not be the migratory patterns of the future migration involves not just the evolution of a specific behavioral pattern but often morphological changes as well the shape of the wing is a structural correlate with migratory behavior migratory species typically have proportionally longer wings with a higher aspect ratio than related non-migratory species this adaptation reduces the relative impact of wing tip induced drag resulting in greater effective lift as well as an often more efficient ratio between wing area and body weight furthermore the outer primary feathers which together with the inner primaries provide forward thrust in flapping flight are often longer in migrants giving the wing a pointed rather than a rounded shape in asia the sedentary black-headed oriole has a rounded wing whereas the closely related black naped oriole with pointed wings is migratory between siberia and india albatrosses falcons swifts various shorebirds and terns many of which make long distance journeys have long more pointed wings even among closely related migrants there is a difference thus the pointed wings of the semi palmated sandpiper which migrates from the arctic to only northern south america has noticeably shorter wings than the beards and white rumped sandpipers that fly from the arctic all the way to the southern tip of south america 
End of chapter 4chapter five of the migration of birds by the u s fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain stimulus for migration the environmental factors that have resulted in the evolution of migratory behavior are not the environmental factors that stimulate development of the migratory condition or actually cause birds to embark on migratory flights if a bird would wait until food on its breeding range became abundant to begin its vernal migratory preparation it would have insufficient time to migrate establish a territory mate incubate eggs and raise young to take advantage of this abundance the timing of its entire annual cycle must result in young in the nest coincident with an optimal abundance of food or other environmental factor that has a critical effect on productivity similarly if birds waited until the climate became no longer tolerable to begin preparations for fall departure from breeding areas it would be too late to gain the necessary energy surplus above the demands of thermal regulation to allow the required physiological changes associated with migration the stimulus for development of the migratory state must be related to the eventual advent of suitable environmental conditions for reproduction or winter survival in the spring the pre-migratory state is characterized by a change in neural centers in the lower part of the brain the hypothalamus controlling hunger and satiety so that the bird gains weight by overeating this increased energy income a food intake that is as much as forty per cent greater than during other times of the year is stored as large fat deposits under the skin in flight musculature and in the abdominal cavity small perching birds like sparrows and warblers gain about one to one point five grams per day and this increased appetite continues over a period of about two weeks prior to migration furthermore these birds retain the ability to rapidly gain weight during stopover periods in the course of their migratory journey while during non-migratory periods fat comprises about three to five per cent of a bird's body weight short and middle distance migrants increase their fat load to about fifteen per cent of their weight while in long distance migrants fat is thirty to fifty per cent of their weight they are literally obese these fat stores fuel the aerobic contraction of flight muscles permitting flights of long duration with minimal fatigue experiments have demonstrated that day length is the environmental stimulus that results in vernal pre-migratory weight gain light not only directly affects the hypothalamic feeding centers but stimulates adjacent centers in the brain to affect a shift in the bird's endocrine secretions specifically increasing prolactin from the pituitary corticosterone from the adrenal gland and the sex steroids that is testosterone from the gonads these hormonal changes facilitate the development of fat deposits resulting from the greater food intake caused by increased appetite the pre-migratory state is also characterized by increased activity during the night which is when most birds migrate they become restless perhaps in anticipation of the migratory flight this behavior is seldom observed in the wild but has been carefully evaluated in captive migrants it has been shown for example that the intensity and duration of migratory restlessness in captives 
are correlated with the distance and period of migration in the wild population like pre-migratory weight gain migratory restlessness is stimulated by long days through the effect of light on the hypothalamus causing increased secretions of prolactin corticosterone and the sex steroids additionally light stimulates the release of melatonin a hormone produced in the pineal body on the top of the brain which has also shown to be necessary for the expression of this behavior it is important to emphasize that the light stimulus is a function of length of the light period rather than because of the change in day lengths it is also clear that the absolute length of the daylight period that is considered long varies with species not only in terms of the day length characteristics of their environments but in the daily period when a species brain is receptive to the effects of light both the external and internal aspects of light stimulation reflect their geographic distributions thus birds wintering in the tropics have evolved a response to that photo period which results in pre-migratory changes similar to that of birds wintering in the north temperate zone under increasing day length even birds wintering in south america initiate pre-migratory preparation in march and april under the decreasing day lengths of the austral fall the adaptation of migrants to the temporal control day length is amazing consider the transequatorial migrant bobolink this species initiates pre-migratory preparation under decreasing day lengths in the south temperate zone migrates northward toward the equator experiencing lengthening day lengths but decreasing daily variation in day length then finally arrives on its previous year's territory somewhere north of the fortieth parallel that birds many plants and other animals depend upon day length to regulate their annual cycles is not surprising of all the variables in the environment only seasonal day length variation has remained constant since the formation of the planet because of earth's rotation on an axis inclined to the plane of its revolution around the sun yet the development of the migratory state is not completely driven by day length birds have evolved closer control of this process by responding to other environmental stimuli either accelerating or inhibiting the rate of response to the primary day length stimulus temperature is one of the environmental factors involved thus when spring is late birds do not arrive too early similarly when spring is advanced the birds arrive early to take advantage of the precocious environmental resources there is also evidence that development of vegetative cover can influence light caused reproductive development when songbirds normally nesting on j mayan island in the arctic ocean arrived during a late spring to find their breeding grounds still snowbound gonadal development was immediately truncated and the birds left even though day length was stimulatory the stimulus for autumnal pre-migratory preparation is not well understood the current working hypothesis suggests that the spring photo period sets an internal timer that allows the expression of fall pre-migratory preparation after the cessation of a reproductive period which has evolved to be commensurate with species specific environmental resources perhaps hormonal changes following breeding release the expression of these preset events in many species the postnuptial or pre-basic molt may inhibit the development of the pre-migratory state in other species however 
migration precedes the fall molt and some species like barn swallows molt while migrating end of chapter five chapter six of the migration of birds by the u s fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain when birds migrate individual birds are relatively sedentary during two periods each year at nesting time and in winter when the entire ava fauna of a continent is considered however during almost all periods there are some latitudinal movements of birds each species or group of species migrates at a particular time of the year and some at a particular time of the day other species are more irregular in their migratory behavior red crossbills for example are erratic wanderers and will settle down and breed any month of the year when and where an adequate supply of conifer seeds is available time of year some species begin their fall migrations early in july and in other species distinct southward movements cannot be detected until winter for example many shorebirds start south in the early part of july while northern goshawks snowy owls common red poles and bohemian waxwings do not leave the north until forced to do so by the advent of severe winter weather or a lack of customary food thus an observer in the northern part of the united states may record an almost unbroken southward procession of birds from midsummer to winter and note some of the returning migrants as early as the middle of february while on their way north purple martins have been known to arrive in florida late in january and among late migrants like some wood warblers the northern movement may continue well into june in some species with a broad latitudinal range the migration is so prolonged that the first arrivals in the southern part of the breeding range will have performed their parental duties and may complete nesting while others of the same species are still on their way north as you should expect northern and southern populations of the same species can have quite different migration schedules in fall migratory populations that nest furthest south migrate first to the winter range because they finish nesting first for example the breeding range of the black and white warbler covers much of the eastern united states and southern canada northwest through the prairies to great bear lake in canada it spends the winter in southern florida the west indies southern and eastern mexico central america and northwestern south america in the southern part of its breeding range it nests in april but those summering in new brunswick do not reach their nesting grounds before the middle of may therefore if fifty days are required to cross the breeding range and if sixty days are allowed for reproductive activities and molting they would not be ready to start southward before the middle of july then with an assumed return fifty-day trip south the earliest migrants from the northern areas would not reach the gulf coast until september since adults and young have been observed on the northern coast of south america by august twenty first it is very likely that they must have come from the southern part of the nesting area many similar cases might be mentioned such as the black throated blue warblers still observed in the mountains of haiti during the middle of may when others of this species are en route through north carolina to new england breeding grounds the more southerly breeding american redstarts and yellow warblers are seen returning southward on the northern coast of south america just about the time the earliest of those breeding in the north 
reached florida on their way to winter quarters examples of the alaska race of the yellow warbler have been collected in mississippi florida and the district of columbia as late as october students of migration know that birds generally travel in waves the magnitude of which varies with populations species weather and time of year characteristically one will observe a few early individuals come into an area followed by a much larger volume of migrants this peak will then gradually taper off to a few lingering stragglers if we plot numbers observed against time the rising and receding curve is bell-shaped in the northern part of the united states there are two general migration waves the first one in early spring consists of hardy birds including many of our common seed eaters like the finches sparrows and others the second wave occurs about a month later and consists primarily of insect eating birds such as flycatchers vireos and warblers each of these species in turn has its own frequency curve of migration within the major wave time of day because most birds are creatures of daylight it seems remarkable that many should select the night for extended travel smaller birds such as rails shorebirds flycatchers orioles most of the sparrows the warblers vireos and thrushes are typical nocturnal migrants it is common to find woods and fields on one day almost barren of bird life and on the following morning filled with newly arrived migrants that came during the night waterfowl hunters sitting in their blinds frequently observe the passage of flocks of ducks and geese but great numbers of these birds also pass through at night the calls of canada geese or the conversational gabbling of flocks of ducks are common night sounds in spring and fall in many parts of the country observations made with telescopes focused on the full moon have shown processions of birds and one observer estimated their passage over his area at the rate of nine thousand per hour this gives some indication of the numbers of birds in the air at night during migratory peaks radar observations have shown that nocturnal migration begins about an hour after sundown reaches a maximum shortly before midnight and then gradually declines until daybreak bird echoes during peak migration periods may cover a radar screen it has been suggested that small birds migrate by night to avoid their enemies to a certain extent this may be true because the group includes not only weak flyers such as the rails but also the small insectivorous birds such as wrens small woodland flycatchers and other species that habitually live more or less in concealment these birds are probably much safer making their flights under the protecting cloak of darkness nevertheless it must be remembered that night migrants also include sandpipers and plovers most shorebirds are usually found in the open and are among the most powerful flyers as some of them make annual non-stop migratory flights over two thousand miles of open ocean night travel is probably best for the majority of birds chiefly from the standpoint of feeding digestion is very rapid in birds and yet the stomach of birds killed during the day almost always contains food to replace the energy required for long flight it is essential that either food be obtained at comparatively short intervals or stores of fat be laid on prior to migration if the smaller migrants were to make protracted flights by day they would arrive at their destination at nightfall almost exhausted since they are entirely daylight feeders 
they would be unable to obtain food until the following morning the inability to feed would delay further flights and result in great exhaustion or possibly even death should their evening arrival coincide with cold or stormy weather by traveling at night they can pause at sunrise and devote the entire period of daylight to alternate feeding and resting this schedule permits complete recuperation and resumption of the journey on a subsequent evening after sufficient fat deposits have been restored banding studies have shown that the number of days an individual lays over during a migration stop is inversely dependent upon the amount of its fat stores upon arrival it has also been hypothesized that nighttime migration is advantageous because environmental temperatures are typically cooler the effort involved in migratory flight generates considerable heat the primary way in which flying birds lose heat in order to maintain an optimum body temperature is through the evaporation of water from air sacs that are part of its breathing system indeed dehydration resulting from regulation of body temperature rather than the amount of fat stores probably limits the distance a bird can fly non-stop thus by flying in cooler air which increases heat loss by conduction and convection less cooling by evaporation of limited body water is required and flight distances are extended the day migrants include in addition to some of the ducks and geese loons cranes gulls pelicans hawks swallows night hawks and swifts soaring birds including broad-winged hawks storks and vultures can only migrate during the day because their mode of flight makes them dependent on updrafts created either by thermal convection or the deflection of wind by topographic features like hills and mountain ridges swifts and swallows feed entirely on diurnal flying insects and circling flocks of these species are frequently seen in late summer feeding as they travel gradually southward similarly large flocks of franklin's gulls in the great plains feed on insects caught in thermals using these updrafts as a source of food as well as the means permitting soaring flight that carries them on their journey with minimal expenditure of muscle power large flocks of swainson's hawks also migrate in the plain states by thermal soaring in the east flights of broad-winged coopers and sharp-shinned hawks are regularly seen along the appalachian ridges soaring on the uplifted westerlies passing over the crests of the mountains because many species of wading and swimming birds are able to feed at all hours they migrate either by day or night some diving birds including ducks that submerge when in danger often travel over water by day and over land at night strong flyers like snow geese can make the entire trip from their staging area in james bay canada to the wintering grounds on the louisiana gulf coast in one continuous flight these birds are seldom shot by hunters en route between these two points but are often observed migrating by aircraft pilots graham cooch of the canadian wildlife service tracked a flight of the blue phase of this species in 1955. The birds left James Bay on October 17th and arrived on the Gulf Coast 60 hours later after a continuous flight of over 1,700 miles at an average speed of 28 miles per hour. American golden plovers likewise probably make the southward flight from the maritime provinces to the south american coast in one giant leap other arctic shorebirds make spectacular flights 
Bairds, sandpipers, for example, congregate in the Great Plains after a flight southward from above the Arctic Circle, and then depart on a non-stop flight of several thousand miles. This flight takes them off the western coast of Mexico and Central America to eventual landfall in Peru. From there, they continue southward at a more leisurely pace until they reach their wintering grounds in Tierra del Fuego. An interesting comparison of the flights of day and night migrants may be made through a consideration of the spring migrations of the black pole warbler and the cliff swallow. Both spend the winter as neighbors in South America, but when the impulse comes to start northward toward their respective breeding grounds, the warblers strike straight across the Caribbean Sea to Florida, while the swallows begin their journey by a northwestward flight of several hundred miles to Panama. From there, they move leisurely along the western shore of the Caribbean Sea to Mexico, and continuing to avoid a long trip over water, go completely around the western end of the Gulf of Mexico. This circuitous route adds more than 2,000 miles to the journey of the swallows that nest in Nova Scotia. The question may be asked, why should the swallow select a route so much longer and roundabout than that taken by the black pole warbler? The explanation is simple. The swallow is a day migrant while the warbler travels at night. The migration of the warbler is made up of a series of long, nocturnal flights alternated with days of rest and feeding in favorable localities the swallow on the other hand starts its migration several weeks earlier and catches each day's ration of flying insects during flight although most of our smaller birds make their longest flights at night Close observation shows travel is continued to some extent by day. During the latter half of a migratory season, birds may show evidence of an overpowering drive to hasten to their breeding grounds. At this time, flocks of birds maintain a movement in the general direction of the seasonal journey while feeding on or near the ground. Sometimes they travel hurriedly and while their flights may be short, they can cover an appreciable distance in the course of a day. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Migration of Birds by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Flight Speed and Rate of migration there is a widespread misconception concerning the speed at which birds can fly one often hears stories of birds flying a mile a minute while undoubtedly some birds do attain this speed such cases are exceptional and it is safe to say that even when pressed few can develop an air speed of 60 miles per hour Birds, except for the heavy-bodied, small-winged species, such as ox, grebes, and other divers, generally have two different flight speeds. There is a normal rate for ordinary purposes, and an accelerated speed for escape or pursuit that may be double the normal rate. Reliable data on the speed of birds are accumulating slowly accurate measurements are difficult to obtain unless the bird travels over a measured course and wind conditions at the level of flight are known several subtle factors besides wind and pursuit can influence the speed of a flying bird for instance species that have a courtship flight often reach their maximum speeds then small woodland birds often fly faster across an open area where they might be attacked by a bird of prey than under cover where there is less danger birds in flocks generally fly faster 
than when flying alone in general flight velocity of birds ranges from twenty to fifty miles per hour for sustained flight larger birds typically fly faster than smaller birds a common flying speed of ducks and geese is between forty and fifty miles per hour but among the smaller birds it is much less herons hawks horned larks ravens and shrikes timed with an automobile speedometer have been found to fly twenty two to twenty eight miles per hour whereas some of the flycatchers fly at only ten to seventeen miles per hour even such fast flying birds as the morning dove rarely exceed thirty five miles per hour a peregrine falcon will have difficulty catching a pigeon during a level chase at sixty miles per hour but this predator can probably exceed one hundred miles per hour during a stoop from a greater height onto its prey although this velocity has never been accurately measured the rate of migration is quite different from that attained in forced flights for short distances a sustained flight of ten hours per day in still air would carry herons hawks crows and smaller birds from one hundred to two hundred and fifty miles while ducks and geese might travel as much as four hundred to five hundred miles in the same period measured as straight line distances these journeys are impressive and indicate birds could travel from the northern united states or even from northern canada to winter quarters in the west indies central or south america in a relatively short time especially if they took advantage of tailwinds it is probable that individual birds do make flights this long and that barn swallows seen in may on beata island off the southern coast of the dominican republic have reached that point by a non-stop flight of three hundred and fifty miles across the caribbean sea from the coast of venezuela radar has provided some of our best estimates of ground speeds for migrating flocks radar echoes identified as shorebirds migrating off the new england coast moved steadily about forty five miles per hour for several hours songbird echoes typically traveled around thirty miles per hour some birds appear to reduce flight speed in proportion to the degree of assistance from a tailwind thus conserving energy the intensity of migration depends not only upon extrinsic environmental conditions but also on intrinsic circumstances affecting the drive motivating the bird's behavior birds travel faster when hurrying towards the breeding grounds radar investigations along the eastern coast of the united states and in england indicate spring migration is several miles per hour faster than in the fall also directions of the migrants in the spring were less diverse than in the fall suggesting less time lost in passage furthermore fat stores in the spring are greater than in the same species during their fall migration this would provide vernal migrants greater energy reserves for longer flights at that season in fall the flights are more leisurely so that after a few hours of flying birds often pause to feed and rest for one or several days particularly if they find themselves in suitable surroundings some indication of this is found in the recoveries of banded birds particularly waterfowl if we consider only the shortest intervals between banding in the north and subsequent recovery in the south it usually takes a month or more to cover a straight line distance of a thousand miles for example an american black duck banded at lake sugog ontario was killed twelve days later at vicksburg mississippi 
if the bird was taken shortly after its arrival the record would indicate an average daily flight of eighty three miles a distance that could have been covered in about two hours flying time among the thousands of banding records of ducks and geese evidence of rapid migrations is decidedly scarce for with few exceptions all thousand mile flights require two to four weeks or more among sportsmen the blue-winged teal is well known as a fast flying duck and quite a few of these banded on canadian breeding grounds have covered two thousand three hundred to three thousand miles in a thirty-day period nevertheless the majority of those that have traveled to south america were not recovered in that region until two or three months after they were banded probably the fastest flight over a long distance for one of these little ducks was one made by a young male that traveled three thousand eight hundred miles from the delta of the athabasca river northern alberta canada to maracaibo venezuela in exactly one month this flight was at an average speed of one hundred and twenty five miles per day a very rapid migration speed was maintained by a lesser yellow legs banded at north eastham cape cod massachusetts on twenty eight august nineteen thirty five and killed six days later one thousand nine hundred miles away at lamenton martinique french west indies this bird traveled an average daily distance of more than three hundred and sixteen miles it seems probable that most migratory journeys are performed at a slow rate of flight migrating birds passing light ships and lighthouses or crossing the face of the moon have been observed to fly without hurry or evidence of straining to attain high speed the speed or rate of migration would therefore depend chiefly on the duration of flights and tail wind velocity the canada goose affords a typical example of regular but slow migration its advance northward is at the same rate as the advance of the season in fact the isotherm of thirty five degrees fahrenheit sixteen degrees centigrade appears to be a governing factor in the speed at which these geese move north from an evolutionary viewpoint we might expect this if the geese continually advanced ahead of the freezing line they would find food and open water unavailable by migrating north just behind the advance of this isotherm birds that breed in the far north will find food and open water available and have as long a breeding season as the climate will allow few species perform such migrations that follow suitable conditions so closely many species wait in their winter homes until spring is well advanced then move rapidly to their breeding grounds sometimes this advance is so rapid that late migrants actually catch up with species that may have been pressing slowly but steadily northward for a month or more the following examples of well-known migrants illustrate this the gray-cheeked thrush which winters in northern south america does not start its northward journey until many other species are well on their way it does not appear in the united states until the end of april twenty five april near the mouth of the mississippi and thirty april in northern florida a month later or by the last week in may the bird is seen in northwestern alaska therefore the four thousand mile trip from louisiana was made at an average rate of about one hundred and thirty miles per day another example of rapid migration is furnished by the yellow warbler this species winters in the tropics and reaches new orleans about april fifth when the average temperature is sixty five degrees fahrenheit thirty one degrees centigrade 
by traveling north much faster than the spring season progresses this warbler reaches its breeding grounds in manitoba the latter part of may when the average temperature is only forty seven degrees fahrenheit twenty two degrees centigrade they encounter progressively colder weather over their entire route and cross a strip of country in the fifteen days from may eleventh to may twenty fifth that spring temperatures normally take thirty five days to cross this catching up with spring is typical in many species that winter south of the united states as well as in most northern species that winter in the gulf states the snow goose presents a striking example of a late but very rapid spring migration most of these geese winter in the great coastal marshes of louisiana where every year over four hundred thousand spend the winter congregations of fifty thousand or more may be seen grazing in pastures or flying overhead in flocks of various sizes their breeding grounds are chiefly on baffin and southampton islands in the northern part of hudson bay where conditions of severe cold prevail except for a few weeks each year even though the season in their winter quarters is advancing rapidly their nesting grounds are still covered with a heavy blanket of ice and snow thus snow geese remain in the coastal marshes until the last of march or the first of april when local birds are already busily engaged in reproduction these data support the general hypothesis that a species pre-migratory development in response to stimuli such as day length and temperature has evolved so that the timing of its physiological preparation will lead to its arrival on the breeding range at the optimum conditions for reproduction the flight northward is rapid almost non-stop so far as the united states is concerned although the birds are sometimes recorded in large numbers in the mississippi valley along the platte in nebraska and in eastern south dakota and southeastern manitoba normally however there are few records anywhere along the route of the great flocks that winter in louisiana when the birds arrive in the james bay region they apparently enjoy a prolonged period of rest because they are not seen in the vicinity of their breeding grounds until the first of june during the first two weeks of that month they pour into the arctic tundra by the thousands and each pair immediately sets about the business of rearing a brood the american robin is a slow migrant taking an average of seventy eight days to make the three thousand mile trip from iowa to alaska the same stretch of country is crossed by advancing spring in sixty eight days in this case however it does not necessarily mean that individual robins are slow the northward movement of the species probably depends upon the continual advance of birds from the rear so that the first individuals arriving in a suitable locality are the ones that nest in that area while the northward movement of the species is continued by those still to come there is great variation in the speed of migration at different latitudes between the gulf of mexico and the arctic ocean the black pole warbler again furnishes an excellent example this species winters in northwestern south america and starts to migrate north in april when the birds reach the southern united states some individuals fly northwest to the mississippi valley north to manitoba northwest to the mackenzie river and then almost due west to western alaska a fairly uniform average distance of thirty to thirty five miles per day is maintained from the gulf to minnesota but a week later this species has reached the central part of the mackenzie valley and by the following week it is observed in northwestern alaska during the latter part of the journey therefore 
many individuals must average more than two hundred miles per day thirty days are spent traveling from florida to southern minnesota a distance of about one thousand miles but scarcely half that time is used to cover the remaining two thousand five hundred miles to alaska increased speed across western canada to alaska is also shown by many other birds a study of all species traveling up the mississippi valley indicates an average speed of about twenty three miles per day from southern minnesota to southern manitoba sixteen species maintain an average speed of about forty miles per day from that point to lake athabasca twelve species travel at an average speed of seventy two miles per day while five others travel to great slave lake at one hundred and sixteen miles per day and another five species cover one hundred and fifty miles per day to reach alaska this change corresponds to variation in the isothermal lines which turn northwestward west of the great lakes as has been previously indicated the advance of spring in the northern interior is much more rapid than in the mississippi valley and on the gulf coast in the north spring comes with a rush and during the height of migration season in saskatchewan the temperature in the southern part of the mackenzie valley just about equals that in the lake superior area seven hundred miles further south such conditions coupled with the diagonal course of the birds across this region of fast-moving spring exert a great influence on migration and are probably factors in the acceleration of travel speed end of chapter seven chapter eight of the migration of birds by the u s fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain migratory flight altitude while factors regulating the heights at which birds migrate are not clear there are many obvious reasons why flying at higher altitudes may be advantageous high altitude flight may be used to locate familiar landmarks fly over fog or clouds surmount physical barriers gain advantage of a following wind or maintain a better thermal regulatory balance in general estimates of bird heights based on direct observation are quite unreliable except under special conditions a eurasian sparrow hawk could be distinguished at eight hundred feet but disappeared from sight at two thousand eight hundred feet a rook a european member of the crow family could be recognized at one thousand feet but disappeared from sight at three thousand three hundred feet an interesting experiment with an inflated model of a vulture painted black with a wing span of seven feet ten inches illustrated similar limitations when released from an airplane at four thousand seven hundred feet it was barely visible and invisible without binoculars at five thousand eight hundred feet at seven thousand feet it was not picked up even when twelve power binoculars were used radar studies have demonstrated more accurately than human vision that ninety five per cent of the migratory movements occur at less than ten thousand feet the bulk of the movements occurring under three thousand feet yet birds do fly at higher altitudes bird flight at twenty thousand feet where less than half the oxygen is present than at sea level is impressive if only because the work is achieved by living muscle tissue a himalayan mountain climber at sixteen thousand feet was rather amazed when a flock of geese flew northward about two miles over his head honking as they went 
at twenty thousand feet a man has a hard time talking while running but those geese were probably flying at twenty seven thousand feet and even calling while they traveled at this tremendous height numerous other observations have come from the himalayas observers at fourteen thousand feet recorded storks and cranes flying so high that they could be seen only through field glasses in the same area large vultures were seen soaring at twenty five thousand feet and an eagle carcass was found at twenty six thousand feet the expedition to mount everest in 1952 found skeletons of a northern pintail and a black-tailed godwit at sixteen thousand four hundred feet on kumbu glacier bar-headed geese have been observed flying over the highest peaks twenty nine thousand feet plus even though a ten thousand foot pass was nearby probably at least thirty species regularly cross these high passes other accurate records on altitude of migratory flights are scanty although altimeter observations from airplanes and radar are becoming more frequent in the literature for example a mallard was struck by a commercial airliner at twenty one thousand feet over the nevada desert radar observations have revealed that birds on long distance flights fly at higher altitudes than short distance migrants it has been hypothesized that advantageous tailwinds of greater velocity are found higher up and that the cooler air minimizes the demand for evaporative water loss to regulate body temperature under the exertion of flight radar studies also have shown that nocturnal migrants fly at different altitudes at different times during the night birds generally take off shortly after sundown and rapidly gain maximum altitude this peak is maintained until around midnight then the travelers gradually descend until daylight thus there is considerable variation but for most small birds the favored altitude appears to be between five hundred and one thousand feet some nocturnal migrants probably shorebirds fly over the ocean at fifteen thousand or even twenty thousand feet nocturnal migrants also fly slightly higher than diurnal migrants observations made from lighthouses and other vantage points indicate that certain migrants commonly travel at altitudes of a very few feet to a few hundred feet above sea or land sandpipers red-necked phalaropes and various sea ducks have been seen flying so low they were visible only as they topped a wave observers stationed at lighthouses and lightships off the english coast have similarly recorded the passage of land birds flying just above the surface of the water and rarely rising above two hundred feet over the waves end of chapter eight chapter nine of the migration of birds by the u s fish and wildlife service this librivox recording is in the public domain segregation during migration as individuals or groups of species during the height of northward movement in spring the woods and thickets may suddenly be filled in the morning with several species of wood warblers thrushes sparrows flycatchers and other birds it is natural to conclude they traveled together and arrived simultaneously probably they did but such combined migration is by no means the rule for all species as a group the wood warblers probably travel more in mixed companies than do any other single family of north american birds in spring and fall the flocks are likely to be made up of the adults and young 
of several species sometimes swallows sparrows blackbirds and some of the shore birds also migrate in mixed flocks in the fall great flocks of blackbirds frequently sweep south across the great plains with common grackles red-winged blackbirds yellow-headed blackbirds and brewers blackbirds included in the same flock on the other hand many species keep strictly to themselves common night hawks fly in separate companies as do american crows cedar waxwings red crossbills bobolinks and eastern kingbirds and it would be difficult for any other kind of bird to keep company with the rapid movements of the chimney swift besides flight speed feeding habits or roosting preferences can be so species specific as to make traveling with other species incompatible occasionally a flock of ducks will be observed to contain several species but generally when they are actually migrating individuals of each species separate and travel with others of their own kind even if different species do not migrate together we often find many species passing through an area at the same time if the different kinds of birds observed in a specific area are counted every day throughout the entire migration season this count often rises and falls much like the bell-shaped curve exhibited when the number of individuals of a given species are counted throughout the same time period figure seven shows two peaks in the number of species passing through the desert at the north end of the gulf of elat akaba in the red sea these two peaks coincide with peaks in the numbers of individuals mostly perching birds traveling through the area therefore in the latter part of march and again in april there are not only more birds in the area but also more species closely related species or species that eat the same food are not often found migrating through the same area at the same time in north america peaks in the migration of the five species of spotted thrushes generally do not coincide dates of departure in these species have evolved so all the individuals of these closely related birds do not converge on one area at the same time and subsequently exhaust the food supply by selection of staggered peak migration dates the processes involved in evolution have distributed the members of this family more or less evenly throughout the entire season likewise in the eastern mediterranean area we find a similar situation during spring migration for three closely related buntings kretschmar's bunting comes through first followed a few weeks later by the ortolan bunting and at the end of the migration period the black-headed bunting appears many groups of migrating species like shorebirds blackbirds waxwings and buntings maintain a close flock formation other species like turkey vultures hawks swifts blue jays swallows and warblers maintain a loose flock and still others like shrikes belted kingfishers grebes and winter wrens ordinarily travel alone just as flocking among resident birds provides group protection against predators and facilitates food finding flocking of migrants probably serves the same purposes the v-shaped flocks associated with canada geese and double crested cormorants have a definite energy conserving function by allowing members of the flock to gain an aerodynamic advantage from the wing tip vortices of the bird ahead it has also been observed from radar studies that day migrants fly in tighter formations than flocks migrating by night 
this again may reflect a strategy to deter the effect of aerial predators by age the adults of most birds abandon the young when they are grown this gives the parents an opportunity to renew their plumage and gain fat stores before starting for winter quarters the young may move south together ahead of their parents as has been documented in a number of species including mourning doves and the common swift and white storks in europe in sharp shinned hawks passing through wisconsin the immatures are much in evidence during mid-september while the adults come through a month later far to the south in antarctica young adelie penguins depart for coastal wintering grounds much earlier than adults in a few species adults depart south before the young adult american golden plovers hudsonian godwits and probably most of the arctic breeding shorebirds leave the young as soon as they are capable of caring for themselves and set out for south america ahead of the juveniles likewise data for the least flycatcher indicates adults migrate before the young but this segregation does not occur in the closely related hammond's flycatcher in europe adult red-backed shrikes are known to migrate ahead of their young in contrast geese swans and cranes remain in family groups throughout migration the parent birds undergo a wing molt that renders them flightless during the period of growth of their young so that both the adults and immatures acquire their flight capabilities at the same time and are able to start south together large flocks of canada geese for example are composed of many family groups when these flocks separate into small v-shaped units it is probably correct to assume an older goose or gander is leading the family after female ducks start to incubate their eggs the males of most species of ducks flock by themselves and remain together until fall when segregation of the sexes such as this occurs the young birds often accompany their mothers south by sex males and females may migrate either simultaneously or separately although there are exceptions generally passerine males arrive before females thus in spring great flocks of male red-winged blackbirds reach a locality several weeks before any females the first american robins are usually found to be males as are the first song sparrows rose-breasted grosbeaks dick sissels and scarlet tanagers in europe the three buntings mentioned previously are also segregated as to sex during migration figure eight shows two prominent peaks for both the kretschmars and ortolan buntings during passage the first peak was primarily males while the second peak consisted mostly of females this early arrival of males on the breeding grounds is associated with the establishment of territories in which each male defends a definite area from trespass by other males of his own kind while announcing his presence to rival males and later arriving females by song or other displays the female then selects the site where she wishes to nest in the fall common and king eiders are sexually segregated during migration during july flocks crossing point barrow are composed almost entirely of males while after the middle of august the flocks are almost all females in the chicago area male hermit thrushes swainson's thrushes great cheek thrushes and veeries arrive before any females and predominate during the first week of passage in a few species the males and females arrive at the breeding grounds together and proceed at once to nest 
in fact among shorebirds ducks and geese and the osprey courtship and mating often takes place while the birds are in the south or on their way north so that when they arrive on the northern nesting grounds they are paired and ready to proceed at once with raising their families mallards and american black ducks may be observed in pairs as early as december the female leading and the male following when they take flight in the pacific slope flycatcher the sexes appear to migrate in synchrony during the spring in contrast to migration of the closely related hammond's flycatcher in which the adult males usually precede the females both sexes of the common black cap of europe appear to migrate together at least across the eastern end of the mediterranean during the spring End of chapter nine